DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of Conversations with Dr. Lillis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual masterwork, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. It's wonderful to be with you, Chris. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about one of the most beautiful spiritual books ever written, especially where we're going today. This is priceless. It's beautiful, beautiful work. And I think a teaching that in our culture is so important, I think, in retreat centers all across the country, there's a diversity of opinion precisely on this chapter three of book four of the interior castle. And I think Teresa of Avila, she sheds just a lot of beautiful light for us. This is the mansion that even Teresa said she believes many, many souls will dwell in. She feels this is the one that is probably the most apropos for most souls. Is that a fair way of characterizing it? Uh, Yeah, I think by many, she means if you're disciplined in your spiritual life and you're taking your devotion to Christ seriously and and you have the right spiritual director, this kind of prayer that we're going to be talking about today that isn't that far away, it's something that the Lord often brings us into. For some of us, because of the activity of our lives and where we're at, maybe we just get a taste of this for a little bit and then we have to go back to other activities and so forth. But I think Teresa of Avila would that all of us would let the Lord call us into this kind of prayer and allow ourselves to enjoy it. I personally believe that if more people, more Catholics, would allow themselves to enjoy the kind of prayer that Teresa of Avila is talking about in this particular book, in this particular chapter, I think they would find a lot more strength and courage to live the spiritual life than they otherwise would. I I think sometimes people get discouraged in the spiritual life because they don't allow themselves to enjoy the beautiful work that God is doing there in this kind of prayer. And in this chapter, chapter three of the fourth mansion, she brings back a term that I recall experiencing in her other writings. I think it was in The Life and maybe even The Way of Perfection, where she speaks about the prayer of recollection. Bearing in mind that this is written um, how many years later, 14 years after those initial works, it seems to be just a little different than what she had described in those earlier works. Did I read that correctly, Anthony? Yeah, here, after this much time, but also beautiful conversations with other great theologians, she's going to speak in particular in this chapter about her reading and exchanges with the great mystic uh, St. Peter of Alcantara. They're working on this particular prayer because this is where God leads so many of us, and but where mistakes get made, where people try to force things rather than receive graces as a gift. And the particular kind of prayer you're talking about is recollection. What she's come to see is that there is a kind of recollection of soul and awareness of the presence of God that we can arrive at by the spiritual industry of our own imagination and the, uh, you know, spiritual exercises with our intellect, with our mind. And that kind of recollection is very, very good. She's not trying to discourage that at all. But she is aware, especially all these years living the contemplative life, that there's another kind of recollection, not acquired so much by our own activity, but infused by the Lord himself. 
And the beauty and the grandeur and the majesty of this kind of recollection, what it produces in the soul, is so beautiful. She wants to draw our attention to that. And she wants to give us some concrete counsel on how to avail our soul to that. And she's doing this in the backdrop of some teaching that she doesn't think is very helpful. And so in her conversations with St. Peter about Kentara, she's discovered some beautiful spiritual counsel, and she provides it in this chapter. It was so encouraging for me to see her in this moment with the prayer of recollection, how it, it even for the great St. Teresa of Avila, that you can see her prayer, I can't think of another word besides maybe evolving or transforming or growing, even after th that original classic, The Way of Perfection. I mean, that it, over time, she continues to grow in her wisdom and understanding. And for her to, to be able to articulate that, even though she would say she can't articulate it. <laughs> <laughs> she's trying to explain mm. it to us. And yet, I think that's very hopeful for all of us. And it's also a moment for great humility. When we think we know it all, and we were writing it down, and we think we got it, we actually, there's so much more, isn't there? Yes, it's a beautiful development to watch her thought from the light to the way of perfection into the spiritual castle. There's a way in which she becomes more theologically precise in her understanding of what God is doing at different, in the different degrees of prayer, in earlier degrees which kind of call upon us to cooperate with God, and really what God is doing is cooperating with our decisions to follow Him. He, he helps us follow Him clo more closely. And then there's this shift where we are kind of sanctioning or availing ourselves, permitting, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to God's work, to something God is doing in us. And it requires a even more intense kind of responsiveness. I don't want to make it sound like it's passive, that we're not doing anything and God's doing it all. It's, but because of what God is doing, it's evoking a response in us that we wouldn't otherwise be able to make. He's the chief actor. He's drawing our whole being into something. And um, so this infused uh, mystical work of God this is what she began to understand more and more clearly theologically as she went. If you read the earlier work, somebody could say, well, then we don't, should, you know, let's not read the earlier works. We just read this one. And the disadvantage of that is that when you read the life of Teresa of Jesus, when you read her life, there is kind of like almost a, a rawness of the experience. While she's writing, she's saying things like, oh, I remembered this prayer or this morning, even though I hadn't experienced this prayer for some time, this prayer came right back to me. The descriptions she has come right out of the living experience of it. When at this stage of her life, she may or may not be experiencing very often these earlier stages of prayer. God has called her even higher, but she's able now to reflect back and after talking with other mystics, kind of understand even more clearly what happened to her. And so in the earlier works, you get this kind of beautiful, almost raw description. This is what I've experienced or I'm experiencing now. And as you go through her works, you begin to get this more kind of refined reflection. And is one better than the other? I, I think you kind of need both of them to get together to get the full experience, of the full understanding of what God is doing in our life of prayer and what it is like for a soul to be radically open to his operations. This probably, what we're reading right now, is probably her greatest classic of them all, but it builds on all the beautiful descriptions that we've had before. And so she is writing about recollection. She has very much in mind what she wrote about in Way of Perfection and what she, she's written about in the life. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Maurizio Spildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages. 
can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. In the beginning of this particular chapter, she refers to the person who may have begun entry into this particular castle, but for whatever reason, fled, and now may be coming back. She speaking of a very real experience that many of us may have experienced ourselves, don't you think? In this case, I you can't help but also think that there's a little bit of an autobiographic rem- memory going on for her. Up until well into her 30s, she was running away from the Lord. The Lord would draw her into this kind of prayer, and she felt drawn into it. As she was drawn into it, uh, she began to recognize her sinfulness more acutely. And she mistakenly, as did her spiritual directors, she mistakenly thought that the deeper prayer was causing her to be more sinful, but it was actually helping her to face her sinfulness. But because she was getting bad counsel, because she wasn't sure what God was doing, uh, because she was afraid to face the things that the Lord was beginning to reveal to her, she did flee. And so that's here in this description. She, at the very beginning, she makes a description between two different efforts in prayer. The first effort in prayer is when I am choosing to put myself in the presence of the Lord. And so I close my eyes. I fold my hands. I fall down on my knees. I withdraw my mind from uh, thoughts that are uh, purely secular and, uh, and profane. And I, and I try to bend my imagination and my thinking towards the Lord, either through pondering a scripture verse or something. This is one experience of, of recollection. You're collecting your powers. So recollection means collecting your powers and choosing to be aware of the Lord. And you can always do this movement at any time because the Lord is always more present to you than you are to yourself. So no matter what you've done in your life, how bad things are going, how crazy, you can choose to, to make an act of recollection or an act of the presence of the Lord and withdraw from all the secular busyness around you and choose to make yourself mindful of his presence in this moment. That is what we call an ascetical, acquired form of recollection. It, you can even do this so often it becomes habitual. That's an acquired form of recollection. Here she's saying, that 
the kind of prayer she wants to describe in this chapter is not that. She's describing something totally different. She describes, remember her chief image here is that the castle, your soul is like this crystal castle with this beautiful light in the center. And she talks about the inhabitants of this castle. And here it might be good to be aware of a really important anthropological distinction. There is who you are, and then there are the powers of soul that you have. And so your ability to think or your intellect, your ability to feel or your affections, your ability to remember your power of memory, your ability to imagine your power of imagination. These powers are not you. They are things that you have been entrusted with by God. They are given to you as powers of your soul. And what she's saying here is that you may have chosen to go into the castle, but some of the inhabitants who are supposed to come into the castle with you and draw close to this light, they're not there yet. You're, and so you've chosen to go and be with the Lord in prayer, but your imagination has other priorities and, and it's imagining how to make your life better. And, and you might even be, but one of the biggest distractions I think for people who want to pray is their imagination, imagining how spiritual they want to be. And that's still, that's still not drawing close to the Lord, that being outside the castle. Your memory might be stuck in wounds and bitterness from the past or nostalgia where, you know, I would miss the good old days. And so your memory is not inside the castle. Your other powers, your feelings and your passions can also be caught up in things. Your desires can be caught up in things that are not in the castle. Jesus should be the object of our desire. And yet we allow desires for the things that are beneath our dignity and on the very periphery of our, our being to have a tyranny over us they, they, they don't deserve to have. What happens when we bring our passions to the Lord? What happens when we bring our intellect to the Lord? Uh, what happens when we bring our imagination to the Lord, our memory to the Lord? When we, when, when we do this, when we bring them into the castle, um, uh, uh, the Lord begins to transform them in a beautiful way in his life. What she's describing here is a, is a soul whose powers are uh, once were kind of completely treacherous. They were all over the place because the person was all over the place, not withdrawn into the castle. But now that this person has made the decision to, to turn to Jesus, to turn to the light, to enter into the castle, but his powers are still kind of outside the gate, meaning they're very vulnerable to all kinds of attack. How do you get those powers into the gate? And what she's saying, the entryway of the soul into a deeper presence of the Lord, how do you bring these powers in there? And what she's saying is you can't quite do it yourself. In fact, you can't do it yourself at all. You can choose to go in, but your powers to bring those in, it requires the voice of the shepherd. Jesus, the light that burns in the depths, the Holy Trinity burns in our depths, speaks. The voice of Jesus calls us, this word of the Father echoes out, cries out. And as he calls out, the voice of the shepherd beckons the sheep inside. There are beautiful descriptions of shepherds in cultures where they, they still have sheep, and this is a big part of their economy. Some shepherds whistle, some cry out in a song. In the Middle East, the sheep are said to recognize the shepherd's voice and so that two shepherds can walk through each other's herds and each band of sheep will follow the shepherd whose voice it recognizes because it's been with that shepherd so often. Well, similarly, these powers of the soul recognize the voice of Jesus and they begin to be drawn inside. And as they're drawn inside, there's a holy absorption that happens. And rather than being caught up with things on the periphery of our being on the outside, and rather than allowing those things to have tyranny over our, the powers of our soul, all of a sudden a greater freedom to love, to find Jesus is discovered. Uh, these powers begin to race inside, and she calls this holy absorption. And it's really the first degree of infused 
contemplation or infused recollection you can use or prayer of quiet, your powers of the soul are quieted by the voice of the shepherd. That's the kind of prayer that she wants us to avail ourselves to. She wants us to respond with all the powers of our soul to the voice of the shepherd. Now, in a very practical way, I know there are probably some out there who will say, but Anthony, I try so hard to put myself in that type of disposition. I'll go to adoration or I'll find a spot in my home after the kids have gotten quieted down and I open up the scriptures and I'm trying, but then all of the concerns of the world keep popping in and I give them to the Lord and then I talk to the Lord about that. Still, those things are very heavy in the forefront of what I'm trying to experience as it's being explained here. I think what is being described when some, as somebody tries to make themselves present to the Lord, they bend their will to this effort, they try to pull away from, that's this kind of more ascetical grade of recollection. It's something we take up and begin to do, and as we do it, it pleases God greatly, and so he gives us graces that kind of help us in that effort. So there is nothing wrong with that effort. Sometimes you need to watch yourself a little bit because you you almost like strain too much. You kind of exhaust yourself, exhausting yourself. You lose your taste for prayer because, ah, nothing seems to be happening. You know, prayer is about loving Jesus. And if Jesus wants us to struggle for a little while to be silent in his presence by turning our mind from the things of the world and turning our thoughts to the word of God, pondering the scriptures as difficult as that is. If that's what he wants for our prayer, give it to him with all the love that you can. Don't be frustrated that you haven't yet received something that's a pure grace. You know, do whatever we do in prayer, do it out of the Lord. This kind of prayer that we're talking about is granted by the Lord when the Lord desires to give it to us. What it requires from us is a surrender to him and kind of a holy indifference to trying to achieve results in prayer. This is my chief complaint against things, practices like Catholic mindfulness and centering prayer and so forth, or TM. They enter into these kind of techniques and things, wanting results. Prayer isn't about measurable results or states of mind or or the attainment of, of some kind of a psychic uh, achievement where well, now I have peace. And, and so now because I've achieved this peace, my prayer is no longer a waste of time. I'm a great prayer because I, you know, well, you know, in the agony of garden, that, that was agony. It wasn't a state of consciousness where Jesus was ambivalent to the things of the world and nothing bothered him anymore. Things bothered him so much he sweat blood. This is where Christian prayer goes. And so this is not a kind of prayer that we enter into to kind of escape the worries and anxieties of, of our state in life. But it is the kind of prayer where we learn to surrender those things to him. We escape nothing, but we learn to surrender everything. And as we do, Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, she believes that we actually dispose ourselves to this voice of the shepherd. As we try to surrender what's going on in our hearts to the Lord, as we do everything in our power to be aware that God is present to us, as we turn our minds to the Holy Scriptures, as we withdraw from the day-to-day -day activities that consume our conscious awareness all the time, and turn our consciousness to the Lord himself, to the Lord who loves us, to our Father, whom Jesus reveals to us. As we do this, we avail ourselves, we make ourselves vulnerable to the voice of the shepherd. And so this is Teresa's chief counsel. What she's not counseling is what some techniques in prayer kind of advocate. And that is, she doesn't believe in deliberately trying to prevent ourselves from thinking. She doesn't believe in fighting our imagination and making it so that we don't have any images in our brain at all. 
Uh, she doesn't believe that we force ourselves into a kind of silence. Yes, we do renounce, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, fantasies and thoughts that are not worthy of, of the presence of the Lord in us. And so uh, 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 every impurity, we surrender that to the Lord. We also renounce also those things, things that we can't do anything about. And so we let that worry consume us. We will, when we go into prayer, it's time to give that worry to the Lord and to work, to trust him with it. Yes, we do that. But we don't try to stop our minds from thinking. We turn our thoughts to the things of God. We don't stop our imagination from imagining. We allow our imagination to be baptized by the Holy Scriptures and by the truths of our faith. We don't stop having movements of uh, passion in us. There, Rather, we give the movements, those painful and sometimes beautiful movements that are in us and the desires for noble things and the desires for ignoble things. We give those to the Lord. It's up to him to do with those what he will. Some of those desires, yes, we must disavow. Some of them we can hope for and if it's God's will. But we can't stop them. We can't, we don't do violence to our humanity in that sense. We're not Buddhists who are trying to extinguish desire or thought or imagination or memory in us. Rather, we're asking the Lord to sanctify all of that. And so any technique with that is trying to impede the operation, the natural operation of the powers that God has given us, I, I don't think is a very healthy technique. I think rather, these powers are something that God wants to get caught up into the life of prayer. And what we can do by our own efforts is learn to submit these to the Lord. And as we learn to submit these to the Lord, and learning to submit these to the Lord it isn't simply a prayer technique. It's, it's a whole way of life. We have to actively choose to live a more simple life if we want. We have to actively choose to fast. And if we do that, that will dispose us to this, this holy absorption or this prayer of quiet that Teresa of Avila is talking about in this chapter. We'll continue our conversation on this particular chapter of St. Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle in our next episode. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There, too, you will find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.